Well, welcome back to our study in the gospel according to Mark, where we see that Jesus addresses a subject that is very important to us today, which is the subject of leadership. We pick up in chapter 10, verse 32, where we read that Jesus took the 12 aside and he told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. And so this is now the third time that Jesus has predicted his selfless death and resurrection from the cross. And we might wonder, you know, how would the disciples respond to Jesus' teaching about this incredible sacrificial selfless death? Well, we don't have to wonder too much. We read in verse 35 that James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were nicknamed by Jesus the sons of thunder, came to Jesus. And in one of the most embarrassing moments in all of Scripture, we read in the parallel account, Matthew 20, that they brought their mom. And John, of course, is probably a pretty young guy and maybe an early teen, something like that. He brings his mom with him to get Jesus to talk about this thing he needs to talk about. They say, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. So Jesus is like, I don't sign blank checks. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. And so this, in the Old Testament context, this was language of uh, positions of prestige and power. This would be like asking, I want to be your Secretary of Defense and your Secretary of State. We want to be with you in your glory, your honor, your power. This is right after Jesus said, I'm about to die a sacrificial death for the entire world. Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? This language of the cup, this is uh, referring to God's wrath in the Old Testament. We see this repeatedly, that when God's wrath is being poured out, it's, it's described metaphorically in the sense of a cup being poured out on the people. And so Jesus is saying that he's going to take and drink the wrath of God, all the wrongdoing that we deserve the wrath, we deserve the judgment, the justice. Jesus is saying, I'm going to take that. And this word baptism, baptizo, this means to immerse or to, to put into. You know, I could baptize a ship into the sea, something like that. And this word doesn't just mean water baptism. This can refer to actually suffering, as the context would indicate. Or as Luke 12, 50 says, that I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Well, at this point, Jesus had already been water baptized. This is referring to the baptism of the cross being put into the judgment of God. And Jesus says, can you do that? Can you drink that cup? Can you, can you, can you handle that baptism? And they reply, yes, we can. They answer very cavalierly. Jesus said, you will. You will drink the cup I drink. You will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. Yes, church history tells us that James of Zebedee died in AD 44 at the hands of Herod Agrippa I. He was run through with a sword publicly, a public execution. He only made it about 10 or 11 years after the time that Jesus rose from the dead. Early church history tells us that John was exiled to an island, the island of Patmos, which overlooked the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 which must have been torture to look out at all those people that, that he had led to Christ and loved and, and uh, been their leader, and he just couldn't get to them. He was exiled in prison. Tertullian says that John was thrown into boiling oil, but he pulled him out and he was unscathed, unhurt. I don't know. Sounds, sounds like an exaggeration. Regardless, these guys suffered for sure. Jesus said, to sit at my right hand or my left, that's not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Well, when the 10 heard about this, how do you think they're going to act? Like, hey, we're so happy you got a promotion, man. Great job, James. You really earned it, John. Man, you're really, you're the youngest, but you, you deserve that position of authority, right? 
No, they were indignant with James and John. How could you? And you brought your mom with you too. Why would you do that? And so they're all infighting about who is the greatest and who's better and who deserves the positions of power. And Jesus just must have been chuckling over this, just like, okay, this is a teaching opportunity. Jesus called them together and he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, these are people that don't know God, these rulers lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Oh yeah, human nature has not changed in 2000 years. We see this all the time that people are lording it over, using their authority, bossing people around. And Jesus says, not so with you. We have got an entirely new paradigm on what leadership is. I know you see that you know, people in our world today, they boss people around, they, they're, they're ordering people around, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. And then Jesus says, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the teaching of the Bible. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, that Jesus, when he died, it wasn't just a traditional death. It was at least that, but it was definitely more than that, that Jesus died physically. But in addition to this, he drank the cup of God's justice. The one who was innocent took on our guilt so that us who have guilt could become innocent. And many people have heard that Jesus has died for them, but they've never actually personally trusted in that for themselves. And this is why Jesus came. He didn't come to get us to serve him, but to be a servant, even to the point of sacrificial death on a cross. And so this is the basis out of which Jesus not only defined, but actually lived out servant leadership. Well, this is in stark contrast to our world today. People are very suspicious of leadership. In fact, there is a growing, a burgeoning distrust of leadership and authority. We see just in recent years, distrust in the police authorities, that this has actually dropped 5% in just the last six months, according to a recent Gallup poll. We see too that there is a public distrust in government Look back at the times of Camelot, you did Kennedy, uh, Eisenhower, uh, LBJ, and then we just see a precipitous decline, probably Watergate, and then it never really quite recovered, even today. Uh, sometime between Clinton and Bush, that would have been 2011, patriotism was at an high, uh, all-time high, and then it's just, it's just declined. Now we're in the teens, and people are distrustful of government. They also distrust other leadership groups. It's not just one or the other. It's not, I hope you can see that this is a condition of the human heart. Um, they distrust religious leaders. 50% of people wonder if religious leaders, leaders are really there for the public good, are really there for people's good. People distrust their own parents. Uh, today, if you're born, you... 40% of children born today, right now, are actually born out of wedlock. Mom is going to the hospital to give birth, and where's dad? Nobody knows. And so uh, whether it's, you know, religious leaders or police or government or, uh, or your boss, you know, could be even your boss. Anyone in authority is considered automatically, we should be suspicious, guilty until proven innocent, but there's a little bit of truth here. I mean, um, for one, you know, many scandals have exposed and humiliated leaders and authorities. You think of Hollywood, um, people who are supposed to be role models, at least in our culture, these people, the skin has been pulled back and we have just seen one uh, horrific, disgusting sexual abuse, sexual assault case after another. Hollywood has been humiliated. The government, one politician after another, just being publicly exposed, hypocritical, lying. The government has been humiliated. The church, 
Christians. I mean, seeing one example after another of these big megachurch pastors, one after another after another, years of lying, years of hypocrisy and abuse and everything else. I saw an example just this week of a leading Christian who was in a, a pretty serious, gross marital affair, and I can't even give you the details. It's so, so nasty. He, was, uh, he resigned from his place of work, and they gave him a 105 million dollar severance package. It just makes you nauseated to hear about these kind of things. And yeah, so we read that kind of stuff. We see that kind of stuff. It just makes you sick. It makes you wonder, should we be suspicious? We know human nature dictates that people desire power and prestige and position. And so we see that in ourselves and we project it out onto other people. We've had the experience of inept or absentee leaders. Like sometimes they're not an evil leader. They're just inept. They don't know what they're doing. This is usually what people say about their boss. You know, she is an idiot. He is an idiot. Uh, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, if I was in their position, I would do better. Says every employee ever. Everyone thinks that the boss is a fool, a buffoon, doesn't know what he or she is doing. Or they're just absentee. And so many people, many of us, you know, when we hear the words leadership or its twin authority, we, it makes our skin crawl because of the experiences that we've had. And my question is, so what's your plan? You know, people have hurt you in the past. So are you going to punish people in the present who are trying to lead you now because someone hurt you in your past? Like you've got... Uh, someone right now who's like loved you and shown to be trustworthy and cared for you and is trying to pour into your life and you're punishing her, you're punishing him because of something that someone did to you 5, 10, 15 years ago. You know, if you refuse to confront people that have hurt you and to forgive them, that is the biblical teaching, to forgive, to release them of the punishment that they deserve, then that person is going to control you for the rest of your life. I remember talking to one young woman. She said, oh, I could just never go to church, you know. My dad, such a Bible thumper and such a strict disciplinarian. He was so harsh around the house and, you know, he was so legalistic and I could never go to church. Don't you realize that he is still controlling your decisions? Don't you realize that because you haven't forgiven him for what he did in the past, that he's still controlling you right now in the present? He's going to control the way that you parent your kids someday. And Jesus is here to say, I have a complete redefinition of what leadership even is. He wants to change our minds on this. For one, let's define part of our problem. Our suspicion is what is biblical leadership? Well, according to a self-centered model of leadership, leadership is competitive. That's what we see in our world today where we're trying to compete with even, even our colleagues, even our friends, trying to outdo each other. Servant leadership is collaborative. It's not about me, it's about we. It's about what we can do as a group together and trying to work as a team, trying to build up each other, not just trying to be somebody who's really special. In self-centered leadership, we uh, often grow jealous, sometimes even depressed when other people succeed around us. Whereas in servant leadership, when other people succeed, we're happy. That's our goal. Our goal is not to get people under us, as you hear in the corporate world. You know, how many people you got under you? Our goal is to get people over us. We're trying to lift other people up into positions of influence and greatness, godliness. The self-centered model, you know, they view talented people actually as a threat to their ego. They're afraid if I bring in this talented girl, this talented guy, uh, they, boy, they could, uh, they could outdo me. They could make me look bad, not as gifted, not as, uh, not as good. Servant leaders, they view talented people as a God-given asset, working hard to equip these people. That's the idea. I remember it, as, a, as a younger guy, I, I was trying to uh, mentor a, a young believer in the Bible, and I was trying to teach him the Bible, and, and um, he brought up uh, the book of Isaiah. And I had my Bible open. I, I didn't even know that was a book in the Bible. 
And so I was like, yeah, it's Isaiah, 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 Isaiah. Yeah, I know that book. Yeah. How do you say it again? <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't even say it. And uh, that week right there, I was like, I'm signing up. They were doing a, a survey of the Bible class. I'm like, I got to take that class. I was looking at this guy and uh, I was thinking, this guy is pretty sharp. And I was thinking, uh, he's probably, he probably knows that too. He probably knows he's sharp too. So I'm going to do whatever I can. I'm going to work as hard as I can to stay ahead of this guy, even if it's only a week or two ahead. Not out of competition, but so that I can have something to offer and give him. Self-centered leadership, for some reason, they can never find a time to pray. Always too busy with important things, you know, not like prayer. Uh, they got real work to do, not praying. Servant leadership, not this way. Did you realize that Jesus never taught his disciples how to teach, but he did teach them how to pray? So to Jesus, this comes right at the top of the list. When you think of things that are most important in your life, of what you could be pursuing, prayer right at the top. Uh, Self-centered leaders, very defensive when receiving feedback because this is part and parcel with their ego. If your ego is tied up with what you're doing, you're going to be defensive. Whereas servant leaders, even if they don't agree with the whole, it's like they're trying to find the diamond in the dirt. You know what I mean? Like uh, somebody says some things to you and you're like, that's not quite accurate and that's not quite true. And uh, I don't know, that never really even happened. But a servant leader is searching for that little nugget, that little uh, bit of truth, even if, even if not everything is correct, even if they didn't say it the right way, even if they didn't say it at the right time, they didn't have the right tone, whatever, whatever, whatever. That's self. That's all that is. Servant leaders are saying, I'm trying to find what it is that you're trying to communicate because God could be trying to speak through you. And I'm going to sift through dirt if I have to, to find that one, that one piece of gold that God has for me through you. Self-centered leaders are desperate for recognition from their peers. Servant leaders are not this way. They, they like the recognition, but it's a, it's a bonus. It's exciting to be able to get recognition from peers. Really, their, their, their steam engine is run on the recognition which comes from God. For self-centered leaders, they really love the title of leadership. Whereas with servant leaders, they really enjoy the role. It's like when you look at them, whether they had the title or not, they would want to be doing the same things. Helping, loving, serving, building people up. And yes, if they got the title, that's okay. You know, they don't want to be too scared to step into a position of leadership. But they're also not so prideful that they're trying to push themselves into that position either. And so that is servant leadership. Now, why would anyone want to do that? If Jesus is the exemplar of servant leadership dying on a bloody cross, and this is what servant leadership is, why would we ever want to do this? I can think of a few reasons. For one, it's biblical. It's just as biblical as anything else we read in the New Testament. You know, when the Bible says that we're supposed to share the love and message of Christ with other people, that's biblical and it's important. When it says that we're supposed to study and build up other believers in Christ, teach them, mentor them, pray for them, that's biblical. When it says that you're supposed to speak the truth in love, that's biblical. And so is this. God works through leaders. We see that right from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end, that God has chosen, not that he needs us, but that he's chosen to work through leaders. Number two, it's simply unavoidable. Okay, leadership means influence. So, you know, many people would say, oh, I could never be a Christian leader. I don't know about that, man. That just sounds like too, I don't know. But then at work, they're taking on positions of leadership and authority. They don't seem to have a problem with that. You know, when you get married, I hope you're thinking about how you can um, grow and motivate and nurture your marriage. I hope you're thinking about how you can lead and make an impact and a loving influence on your kids. I mean, right on down the line, uh, either I'm going to be thinking like a leader or I'm going to be thinking like a follower. Which do you want to be? Thirdly, leadership is meaningful. It's meaningful. I can't think of a more meaningful thing to do than to have an influence on people in my life. It feels so good. 
you know, imagine if you were talking to your boss and he said, uh, hey, you know, move these boxes uh, to the garage and then uh, tomorrow, you know, move them back. You're like, okay, uh, are, they, are we going to empty them over there? No, no. You're like, all right, uh, wh uh, why are we doing that? Nah, just move the boxes there and move them back tomorrow. So you do that. And then the next day he says, all right, do it again. And then the next day he says, all right, do it again. And uh, do it again, do it again. You know, at a certain point, I'd be looking at this thinking to myself, uh, you know, what's wrong with this picture? It's not the physical labor, right? Because we work hard at work all the time. It's not like lifting the boxes that's the problem. It's not even the repetition necessarily because, you know, we do a lot of repeated things that we really enjoy. Uh, a lot of our hobbies are this way. It's not the work. It's not the repetition. It's the complete lack of meaning. That's the problem. And uh, yeah, if he was going to ask me to move those boxes a third or fourth time, I'd want like a reason, you know, like I want like, a, why are we doing this? What's amazing is that many people will put one foot in front of the other every day, going to work, going to school, getting married, having kids, uh, you know, going, getting retired, picking out, you know, a good country club and all that. They do all these things and they don't have a single reason for why they do them. How about that? Yeah, I would want a reason to see why is this meaningful and boy, to think, to have an impact on people for eternity. That, that is the definition of meaning. We read too from secular studies, those who reported meaningful lives had a decreased risk of dying by 30%. Middle-aged men who reported higher levels of boredom were two times as likely to have a heart, heart attack over a 20-year period. Retirement increased the risk of depression by 40%. You know, we see uh, some people choose to continue to work after they retire. And we look at them and we say, oh, those poor people, you know, they're ch choosing to work. And uh, actually, many people hate sitting at home. It's part of our nature that we want to be doing something that's meaningful. So too, leadership is rewarding. It brings happiness to see the love of God coming into my life and being uh, spread out into other people's lives. Some of your best friends are made this way. Brings a lot of happiness, a lot of joy. Is it uh, 3 John 4, where John says, I have no greater joy than to see my children walking in, the, in love, walking in faith. By his children, he means people that he's led before. And of course, number five, leadership is necessary for healthy groups. One of the worst conditions to be in is a group without a leader. This is uh, one of the circles of Dante's Inferno. This is just terrible to be there. And uh, what are we doing? What's, what's the mission? What's the vision? What's the plan? And it's just, it's just a constant uh, ping pong game where everyone's throwing their ideas out and no one is there to bring excitement, thoughtfulness, prayer, vision. And uh, we should be thankful for the leaders that God has put in our lives. Well, how is it that we grow into servant leaders? For one, let me suggest that you just start small and just look for needs. Look for areas around you where you can see, you know, it's good. It's just not great. You know, maybe it's, uh, it's all right, you know, but it could use some work. And it seems like no one has taken it upon themselves to do anything about this. And so go out and write yourself a job description. Go out and do it. And uh, no one's stopping you. Just if you see an area, a person, you know, a person that's being ignored and uh, no one seems to care. Uh, instead of saying, hey, who's going to care for this person? Uh, looks like you just signed yourself up there, man. Get in there and, and work on some of this relational love to build in. Uh, then, uh, and these aren't in any particular order, but... Um, Having a one-on-one -on -one influence is best. This is where we can really get into people's lives in a depth that we couldn't in any other capacity, where we start to build friendships with each other. Uh, this, this could be, you know, in a formal setting where we're trying to study the Bible together and pray once a week and, you know, build a relationship that's going to replicate like discipleship. This could also just be where I'm spending time after times of uh, fellowship, going 
going up to people, talking to them, praying with them, uh, asking them about their lives, and just having an influence on people. I had a friend. He, he was just like this. He would just bounce from person to person to person. And at the end of the night, I'd be like, how many people did you talk to one-on-one? -on -one? He'd be like, consistently, five or six people. And uh, he would sit with them, talk to them, build them up, encourage them, maybe give them some counsel and uh, pray with them and then move on to the next person. That is servant leadership right there. Also, our personal study and prayer. When we think about this, uh, what is it that people around us need the most from us? That's a difficult question to answer. The way I would answer it is that they need a spiritual person to love them. And I myself, in my nature, I'm not that way. How is it that you could change this into someone who's actually loving, who cares about other people? One of the most important things that people need from us is our prayer, our study, and to be able to have God's word giving out in a living way. John 15, 4, Jesus says, Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. Yeah, imagine if I had a branch and I was you know, staring at it and just saying, you know, grow, you know, grow, grow. You know, and and uh, how likely would it be that it would produce any kind of fruit? Jesus says, just as likely as you being fruitful unless you remain in me. That's about as likely. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Yes, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do very little. No, just like me yelling at that branch, you can do nothing. And so to sit there in front of the word of God and to take in what God is trying to teach me, uh, irreplaceable. To contemplate how to motivate and inspire other people. This involves some thoughtfulness, some prayer. I guess there's some overlap here. When I'm thinking about others and I'm thinking about some of the things that they're struggling with, that they have opened up about, that they need prayer, sometimes I don't have the answers. I don't know what to say. And um, yet, uh, sometimes you'll be in prayer and contemplation, meditation, and you realize this would be the thing to say. This would be the question to ask. And I think if I was in their shoes, this would be very inspiring to them. But this has to happen in your alone time before you even meet together, where you sit there in front of God and ask, God, what do they need to hear? 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, encourage each other and build each other up. Warn those who are lazy. Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. Now, I don't know if you see what I see, but there is a plethora of ways that we can approach people. Encouragement, building them up, warning them, tender care, patience. In other words, it's not a one size fits all. It's going to take some time to know what is required here. Do I need to build them up? Do I need to exhort them, to warn them, to be compassionate? And we get this before God. Typically, encouragement and building each other up, there seems to be an emphasis there. That seems about right, to encourage other people. We read about the British statesman Benjamin Disraeli and William Gladstone, who were fierce competitors with one another. They both had been prime minister at one point, and they were arguing and fiercely battling with, with each other. Well, there was a report of none other than Winston Churchill's mother, being at a banquet with both Disraeli and with Gladstone. And she had this to say. She said, when I left the dining room after sitting next to Gladstone, I thought he was the cleverest man in England. But after sitting next to Mr. Disraeli, I thought I was the cleverest woman in England. And there's something to this story that when we sit with people, it's not that we're trying to impress them with who we are. It's that we're trying to get into their life and build them up. And when they leave our presence, that they would feel uh, built up. They would feel important. They feel sacred, special. Tom Rath, a business expert, he says, if your boss ignores you, you have a 40% chance of being disengaged. 
If your boss criticizes you, you have a 22% chance of being disengaged. So I guess ignoring people is just the worst. Even criticism is better. But if your boss focuses on your strengths, you have a 1% chance of being disengaged. Yes, encouragement. Finding what people are good at and uh, fanning that flame, giving them the courage to literally encourage them and what they're good at. And then finally, to grow into an example of a Christ-like person. To be someone whom people can imitate. To be someone that when people look at you, they say, that person is like Christ. Like when I spent time with them, I felt like I was hanging out for moments. I felt like I was hanging out with the character of Christ himself. What an honor to hear something like that. In 1 Thessalonians 2.8, we read, Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. You know, when God looks at us, he doesn't just say, uh, you know, I love you, but I don't like you. Uh, think of uh, Hosea chapter 11, verse 8, you know, oh, Ephraim, my heart is overturned within me. And uh, as one person has said, what we need to do is we need to love people until we feel for them, until we feel the affection, until we start to like them, love them until you like them. As an example, well, as we conclude here tonight, Jesus was the one who taught his own disciples. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, he said, The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. You know, one of the solutions to seeing all of these uh, poor leaders in our lives and authority figures is that God would call you into that role and that he would work with you to turn you uh, from your natural state of inwardness to become a loving person just like Jesus. And maybe as we're sitting here tonight, you're getting that specific calling in your heart that you want to start on this renovation project of becoming more and more like Christ. And maybe you're getting the sense that you want to become a servant leader. I'll just tell you, uh, this whole project of servant leadership has been by far the most difficult thing in my entire life I've ever done. But I will say it is the best thing I've ever done in my entire life. So if you're out there thinking about it, do it. Go for it. And uh, you'll get to see uh, what God has for you. Well, as we conclude, let me just say that we have a free book we'd like to give you on why we should believe in the Bible. And you can click on that description in the link below. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you are the ultimate leader. You're so good. You're so loving. And you care for each one of us. I really don't know why you have chosen to put us into any position of influence over anything. And yet your word says that you want us to pray for workers to come about, to to nurture, to lead, and to direct people for the cause of Christ and for your glory. So we pray that you would make us those kind of people that can uh, lead people the way that Jesus did. And Lord, we pray for those people too, who maybe as they're listening, this, this idea of sacrificial servant leadership doesn't make sense because they've never received your sacrifice for them. We pray that right now that they would just trust in what you did for them and receive it into their heart. And uh, we thank you for anybody who might have done that here with us. In Jesus' name, amen.